Welcome to another episode of Insight, a program showcasing the fascinating work of professionals in the field of science and technology. Designed to inspire, motivate, and educate viewers on some of the most cutting edge research projects in progress today. In today's program, we have with us Ismail Ahmed, who is a PhD candidate at the University College London, as well as a team lead for UCLR. Ismail focuses on the development of novel vehicles, often with alternative propulsion methods. UCLR uses the latest computer-aided engineering techniques, such as generative and algorithmic design, in order to optimize and develop their vehicles, helping to smooth out the transition for industry in adopting these new methods. Before we speak to Ismail Ahmed, let's take a brief look at a day in the life of Ismail Ahmed. My name is Ismail Ahmed and I'm a PhD student here at University College London. So UCL is based in central London in Bloomsbury, right next to Euston Station. This building, however, is slightly further away. It's based in King's Cross, called the Mech Space, and essentially it's a workshop and a lab for developing uh, all types of new types of technology. Normally, what happens is that the days are very, very varied. So it depends on what project we're working on and essentially what we're doing that day. But for example, if we're getting close to a deadline on producing one of the cars, then often we'll be working on designs for some of the new parts. Uh, or then taking those designs and uh, trying to manufacture them or making sure that they're up to standard using some of the inspection techniques that we have here. Some days as well, we can often be doing some development work on some of the cars. Uh, for example, using the simulator that we have downstairs to try and create a uh, virtual representation of the car and see how it would perform if we were to build it in real life. So this every day is very, very varied and it depends on which stage of the project we are at. Uh, and that sort of dictates what we're doing that for that day. So the first step to designing the actual vehicle is to create all the components for it uh, in, in virtual. What we have down here is a plate that attaches the actual pedals to the chassis of the vehicle. So that's what we're designing here. So we can then use uh, simulation approaches uh, such as this, which analyzes the stress within that plate as somebody applies the brake and we can look whether it's going to break or not. And we, do, we can go through uh, the analysis that has been generated. So blue areas are areas of low stress on the actual plate, and then red is where we need to have another look and maybe reinforce that area to make sure it doesn't break under load. So we are up here in the machine shop of the mech space, and what happens here is we take the part that we've actually designed on the computer to actual manufacture. And I've got Phil here with me, who is part of the technicians here at MechSpace, uh, who can then talk about a bit more about the manufacture phase. So this is the part in, uh, in Fusion on the, on the computer, which we are then generating um, some G-code, which we can then put into the Denford machine. And it will just make the part exactly as it's been designed. We start from a, a billet of material, um, and then through various different tools that, we, that we've got here, we can then turn it into exactly the same part that's been designed in CAD. So this is a CNC machine, so that is computer numerically controlled. And what it does is it takes a block of metal and then with specific tools, it basically cuts out the exact shape of the part that we need. So it takes that block of metal to that final part that we can then put on, let's say, a car or a drone uh, or any one of the devices that we built here. So what we're doing in this stage is essentially laser scanning the part. And what we're trying to do is make sure that the part that was designed in the computer is actually matching the part that's actually been made. So this machine fires a laser onto the part and then measures every part, every point on that part to make sure that it is within the tolerances specified by uh, the engineering team. So this is the assembly bay where all the projects finally come to fruition. We're taking the parts that we've machined upstairs and we're actually assembling them to the actual vehicle itself. So we can see here now that the part that we machined upstairs, we've now assembled and placed into the vehicle downstairs here. 
So every year Shell runs a competition to see who can design the most fuel efficient vehicle possible. And what we see here is UCL's Hydrone car. And this is UCL's entry into that competition. So the goal behind this is trying to use as little fuel as possible to try and travel the furthest distance. So there's three key aspects in producing a very efficient vehicle. One is having very, very lightweight. So the entire chassis is made out of carbon fiber. Second is the aerodynamic aspects. You want it to be as slippery through the air as possible. So that means disturbing the air as little as possible and making sure that it goes through it very, very efficiently. And then the third is the powertrain. So this runs on hydrogen. The hydrogen is fed into a hydrogen fuel cell, which converts that energy into electricity, which is then used to run the motor. So once we've designed the car virtually, we need to ensure that it's going to perform well in the real world. So what we have here is a simulator platform into which we can put our vehicle's dynamics and all the parts that are uh, going to be running. And then from that, what we can do is actually simulate the actual driving dynamics of the vehicle uh, and ensure that the driver feel com feels comfortable driving the vehicle and that it performs well. So in front of me, I have an F1 style steering wheel. And what this has is all the uh, buttons that basically allow you to change the car's uh, settings. For example, we've got like brake bias, how um, uh, the hybrid system comes in. We also then have a screen on, on, in front of uh, the driver that gives all the information as to what's happening with the car. So for example, if I uh, press the panel shifter, we're now into gear one. And um, as, I, as I press the throttle, we can see the RPM going up and down as well. Viewers, as you have just seen there, a short introduction into the life of Ismail Ahmed. You may be wondering, well, what exactly is mechanical engineering anyway? And what impact could it have on me? Well, let's find out by speaking to the man himself. Ismail, tell us, so what is mechanical engineering and what impact could it have on the average person? Sure, so mechanical engineering is the application of maths and science to develop real world systems. So for example, the cars that are driving around on the streets, our buses, vans, uh, to the aircraft that are flying in the skies, they're all developed by mechanical engineers. So tell me, how would a school or college student, for example, get into the field of mechanical engineering? What would the expectations be of that person? So I think the first thing is to have a curiosity for how things work. So that might be found by, for example, having a tendency to take things apart, to try and understand how they work, to really have that insight into all the everyday objects uh, around us. And I think you can then build on that passion by developing a good skill set within maths and within the science subjects, and then using that to then leverage um, that curiosity that you have for the, for the world around you and how things are built and made uh, to then get into the field of mechanical engineering. And in terms of subjects and uh, grades, for example, what may be the requirements be? Sure. So in terms of that, I think the, the critical subjects for mechanical engineering are, for example, to be very good at maths and specifically physics uh, and more into the mechanics side of these things. So we often do a lot of analysis on the dynamics of a system. So that's how something is moving, um, how it's interacting with the world. And those sort of subjects really do help with um, applying it to then the mechanical engineering field. So we know you obviously specialize in mechanical engineering and at some point I guess you must have made that choice. What drove you to this decision? Why did you choose this subject? So I always had this sort of natural curiosity into uh, like I was saying how things work so I would take them apart and then that curiosity naturally made me progress to then trying to build my own things so I'd make like wooden aircraft um, just in, in my garage at home. And it was that natural curiosity that made me sort of go into the field of mechanical engineering because I knew I wanted to pursue that further to try and build things for, for the world. So generally speaking, uh, one might assume that solutions are sought to address issues or problems that exist. Um, what would you say your research address, tries to address? What kind of solutions or problems is it trying to address? So our research mainly focuses on how we can leverage the huge amount of computing hardware that we have nowadays into the design and engineering process. So just to give you an example, a Boeing 747, which was originally designed in the 1960s, 
That took a team of engineers without any computers three years to go from the initial concept and design phase to having an actual flying aircraft. Um, but if you look, for example, nowadays with like a modern 777 aircraft, that same process has taken engineers in the order of about seven years to get to the same point. And the reason for that is that the complexity of the systems that we're designing nowadays has increased sort of exponentially. But the design tools and, and, and the way we, uh, the workflows that we have to develop those systems has sort of stayed stagnant. So we're trying to figure out how we can leverage the new computing hardware that we have nowadays to really address that gap and be able to design and build things much, much faster. Uh, so have you or any of your team members or colleagues experienced any sort of scientific breakthroughs in, in your research? So we use an algorithm called generative design. And what that essentially does is allows engineers to be able to create, for example, components for a machine automatically using just a computer only. So the previous methods that would, would happen is that an engineer would have to physically draw out a part in something known as CAD, which is computer-aided design. And then they would analyze that part to see whether it could take the stresses and the loads that that part was going to experience. And then they would iterate, it, iterate on, on, on that part. And that is quite a lengthy process. So we've used generative design to basically design a drone frame from scratch in a computer. And what we found is that that algorithm could design a part that was half the weight of what the previously human designed part was. So for the general public, um, are there any practical applications of this type of research? Um, are there any benefits to the public? Sure, so mechanical engineers are really developing all the things that we see around us. Like I was saying before, the cars uh, that are driving around on the street to the aircraft that are in the skies. And really any performance benefit that we get in those, for example, that might be an increase in efficiency in your car, which results in more miles per gallon or less fuel burn in an aircraft. All of those really do trickle down into our everyday lives. So for example, if your car is doing better miles per gallon, you're spending less amount on fuel. Um, and if your aircraft is burning less fuel, you're then spending less on your ticket. So really all the little performance benefits that are happening on the engineering front on all of these vehicles really do end up trickling down to the actual end user. Ismail, thank you very much for your insight. We appreciate it. Uh, and now we will move on to the next part of the program where Ismail will showcase some of his projects and research. The mechanical engineering industry is rapidly changing especially with the growing demand to transition to green energy. For example, we can especially see this in the automotive sector as policy changes have banned the sale of diesel and petrol vehicles in the UK from 2030 onwards. We also have new sustainable materials being incorporated into the design cycle, as well as new novel manufacturing methods. All of these changes are here to reduce cost while also producing better systems that are also friendlier to the environment. However, these policy changes and the ever-growing need to tackle climate change means we need to be able to design and build these new systems in a way that is much, much quicker. However, the current way in which we design these complex systems is extremely fragmented and slow. Just to give you an example, a modern day car can take between three and four years to design and manufacture, while simpler designs in the past have only taken a single year. And the reason for this is that the complexity of modern day systems has increased exponentially, but our design tools have not kept up. And we are still using a traditional engineering methodology where initial concepts are produced. And then through the use of a number of different engineering packages, we analyze these concepts and figure out the performance of each manually. However, this is an extremely time consuming and expensive process to do at scale and also we often include into the design process what is known as human bias, where engineers often think that what has worked in the past may work again in the future. However, there may be a better way that they simply have not explored and therefore miss out on performance gains. And this for an industry that needs to improve the efficiency of its vehicles or look for new novel solutions to the problems they are facing is a very large issue. So what I am working on is how do we address this problem and how do we change the process to allow us to design and build things that are not only better, but designed much faster. 
And the way we are doing this is by employing new technologies to analyze and engineer these vehicles with the modern day computing hardware that we now have. Instead of engineers having to do this manually, what that means is that we no longer have the, that human in the iteration process and therefore the huge amount of time it takes to analyze all of these different designs is no longer there. And what that means in some cases is that we can actually save years from the engineering development cycle as well as being able to design systems that are much better right from that initial concept phase. So just to give you an example of this and what we have done so far is that we have used this process to design a racing drone end to end with these new engineering algorithms. The way it works is that we create a virtual world in which we simulate the flight of millions of drone configurations and each one of these drones acts as a digital twin of what would be produced in real life and reacts also in exactly the same way as its real counterpart. We then ask the computer to analyze the performance of each of these digital drone twins and through that understand what parameters need to be changed in order to maximize performance. For example, the system figures out which combination of motor and propeller to use, how big the battery should be, and how the frame should even be configured. Once that process is complete, we then use another engineering process called generative design to then design the drone frame itself. This is a relatively new technology to be used in industry, and what it allows engineers to do is actually create part of that frame geometry that is optimized to the loads that that part is expected to experience. Now this works and is inspired by the way in which our bones actually grow and shrink. For example, inside your body where the bone experiences a lot of stress, for example, through running or weightlifting, it naturally increases the amount of bone material in that area. And where there is little stress on the bones, they reduce in material. We do the same process to actually artificially grow the drone frame through this generative design process to ensure it is optimized for the loads that are applied to it by the drone's motors. And actually in this specific project, we produce a drone frame that is half the mass of previous human design frames. So through these new algorithms, we have managed to actually design a drone in a matter of minutes where actual prototyping and testing by the drone racing community has taken a few years to reach the same performance. And this we feel is a very significant milestone within engineering and product development where the, where the majority of the work is carried by computed algorithms while humans act as the creative force driving the design process, but not in the actual manual calculation of the actual design itself. And where we see this growing is that you can now have much smaller engineering teams being able to do what is normally accomplished by teams of thousands of people. And hence really in essence, democratizing the engineering process and leading to better project products engineered faster in the future. Ismail, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us into your wonderful world of mechanical engineering and your professional advice. We appreciate that. Thank you. Viewers, as you saw there, scientific research covers a vast array of topic areas and subtopics, each with a plethora of applications to address real life issues. This now brings us to the end of our program today. And I hope now, like me, you are also a little more enlightened into the wonderful world of mechanical engineering. Do join me next time for another episode of Insight. <laughs>